<laughs> um, so in 1975, when the 40s started, what was the street scene like? Who, who were the neighborhoods surrounding you guys in 75? Shit, in 75 wasn't shit surrounding the hood because you see, we original set and, and you know, the hood uh, in, in, in 1975. Now my homeboy uh, Marvin said the hood started in 74. So I gotta respect that because that's my older homie who said 1974. So I'm gonna go with that. So when the hood started, it was only three sets in San Diego and that was the neighborhood Crips, the West Coast Crips, in the five nine brims, you know, so ain't nothing surrounding us, yeah. you know, ain't ain't nothing surrounding us because ain't nothing else going on but but those three sets in seventy five. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so Central City gangsters already turned to five nine brims by seventy five. They was trans. They was making that transformation right around that time, because when I start going to Gumpers on this in the in summer of uh, nineteen seventy seven. They was uh, claiming five nine brims. So in about 75, 76, Central City started making, gradually started making that transformation to where some of them was still saying uh, Central City and some was still saying uh, five nine. Because I remember uh, Hardy Smith uh, from, from the brims, he used to yell Central City for a long time, even after they was five nine brims. You know, and and did you ever come up with some of the guys from Central City before they became Five Nine Brims? No, there was a whole separate community. Yes, they were Central City gangsters over by Ocean View Park, or right where the Five Nine Brims is. I remember seeing Central City gangsters written on a wall. It was some apartments across the street from Ocean View Park, and they had a wall out there, and it said Central City gangsters, real big. It was spray painted. And it, and it was spray painted and it stayed, that graffiti stayed on that wall for years. That Central City Gangster stayed on that wall. And when I was young, I used to be, even before I started banging, I, I would see the Central City Gangsters and I'd be like, Central City Gangsters, man, that sound tough. They, they tough, Central City Gangsters. You know, I, I thought they just, the name uh, sound like they was the toughest dudes around, the Central City Gangsters. So that that's how I heard heard about them. Then they was in five nine. Uh, then and and then country came down here from L A. and uh, and uh, his influence uh, kind of changed them to to Brims. I wonder why they didn't call themselves Central City Brims if they were influenced by country because. There's no 59th Street in that area. Exactly. I, I was saying that in my book when I was giving a little history, because normally you have to be like in that block in L.A. It was like five nine because Baby Boy uh, from the Fruit Town Brims he asked me about that. He said, "Well, how do they have the?" He said, "The five nine Brims." He said, "We have five nine Brims here." He said, "But they live on 59th Street." He said, "Where are your Brims at?" I was like, actually, they live off like 40th and National, 38th and all of that. But that's why the brims change. Just like the neighborhood change from doing this, like Harlem, uh, the brims did the same thing. They dropped, they stopped saying 5'9". Uh, they start saying brims are south, are, 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 are the south, are south side. They kind of winged off of doing things that was associated to L.A., to individualize themselves, you know, uh, to be respected in their own right, you know, just like the hood did when we dropped the the Harlem sign and said, you know, we're gonna just go with neighborhood, you know. So in, in '75, you just said there was only three. There's only three sets. Yeah. Um, and at that time, if I remember correctly, the the neighborhood Crips. And the West Coast Crips were not getting along. There was a uh, yeah. They had a little, they had a little rivalry at that yeah, time. Yeah, because there wasn't no sets, you know, yeah, and yeah. that's how it is. That's what happens when you don't, when you don't have enemies. You your enemy turns into who's ever there with you. Just like the sets in L.A. and how everything started. I mean, the gangs and stuff used to fight. It was racial at first, you know. When they, you know, Compton had what they called the spook hunters. Them was white guys, 
you know, who terrorized black communities, you know, the spook hunters. So the blacks got together and, will, and would uh, band together to fight the spook hunters. And, and the spook hunters held down all the black parts of Compton. They was all from, I mean, uh, George Bush and the president, the former president and his family was from Compton. They lived in Compton and that's when Compton was white and the schools that were there were white schools and they were trying to push blacks out of known black schools now, but they wasn't. So, but so when the whites start moving out of Compton, all the blacks who had banded together to fight against them, they're fighting against themselves now, you know, because the end, because the real enemy then left and now it's just y'all sitting there and now y'all start going at it with each other. And so that's how it was with the coast and the hood. It, it wasn't no competition. We were the two most major sets. The Brims represented, but they wasn't as big and as cause they were still doing, you know, becoming who they was. But the Coast and the Hood was like the two major sets, so it was kind of like we was fighting for that number one slot, you know. So who, who is there any debate about who, who's the first Crip set in San Diego between the West no, Coast? No, I don't think it's a debate against so it. West Coast Crips was first. Okay. I mean, West Coast is the original uh, uh, Crips in San Diego. They had, they had original any set. I mean, you know, uh, when it comes to Crips and Bloods, they were... Uh, I would say that they are, was claiming a long time before a lot of, uh, you know, be, uh, before the hood and, and, and before the brims and definitely before everybody, you know. What year are you giving them? Uh, I would have to give the coast. Uh, I, I, when I first saw uh, the coast, uh, my brother claimed West Coast Wrecking Crew when he was in high school and in a about 1974, uh, you know, so I would say they was around before then. Uh, I would say 1972. I'd have to go with 1972, uh, talk to some of the, uh, some of the OGs and stuff that was 1972. I remember the West Coast Wrecking Crew in 74, West Coast LTD, West Coast Mafia Crips in 74. Uh, you know, they had a lot of different factions in those different early years, you know. So, yeah, they, they've they been around uh, quite some time. So they yeah. were West Coast LTD f before they were West Coast Crips, right? Because they were uh, not a car club, West Coast LTD? Yeah, I forgot what that st uh, st what did West Coast LTD stand just, for. I think LTD uh, stands for Limited, right? Uh, it was, it was. Related, uh, related to a car? They're they going to get me for this. <laughs> <laughs> they gonna get me for this, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, they, so they wore the bummer jackets, and they wore bummer jackets, and they all had it printed out like car clubs had jackets. Our school had these uh, jackets. You know, they had uh, they had all these uh, uh, jackets. You know, printed out uh, with that on it. Uh, I remember uh, West Coast LTD, but I. Uh, don't know if they preceded West Coast Mafia Crips or West Coast uh, Wrecking Crew uh, Crips uh, because those were like three different uh, factions and those were like all in the uh, mid to early uh, 70s. You know, we had factions, you know, like the neighborhood uh, payback crew that was like, uh, you know, committed to retaliation. That's it. They called it the payback uh, crew, and you know. Okay, so now after after these three sets are in existence in the mid '70s, eventually San Diego sets start to pop up more frequently. But what's mm -hmm. the what are the next sets that come on the scene? Uh, the next set uh, that I remember now, early on too. Let me say this. Uh, that there was a set called O'Farrell Park. And uh, oh, oh, uh, now it was called uh, O'Farrell Park Boys, OPB. And uh, they were around in the mid 70s as well. And uh, when I actually went to O'Farrell before I became a crip over in the hood, they had uh, O'Farrell Park Boys, but they wasn't Bloods, our Crips. Uh, actually, some of those guys became Crips, 
uh, that was pretty much run, that was pretty much the ones who kind of started it early on when I was going to O'Farrell. Uh, I remember a couple guys, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna say their names because it has to do with, uh, you know, being from somewhere and then being from somewhere else and people, you know, uh, trip on that. But everybody was from, you know, when it comes to originating of these gangs and stuff, you know, a lot of people, a lot of things uh, transpired. And I, when I look, uh, I look at interviews between different of LA uh, gangs and some of their founders, and they say, you know, I was from West Side. Uh, then in 1974, I started the East Side Crips. In 1976, we started to this, and so they claimed like four or five different things a along the way. But for some reason, these guys uh, feel like it's like some kind of uh, diss or something. But the guys, uh, I do know the ones who who, who uh, started uh, O'Farrell Park, and they did later become uh, uh, affiliated uh, with Crips. But they, like I said, O'Farrell Park wasn't Crips or Bloods anyway at the time. At that time, wasn't none of them claiming Crips and wasn't none of them claiming Bloods. The guys who did become affiliated later on did that on their own without ties to, to O'Farrell Park being either uh, any of that. O'Farrell Park are Bloods now, and uh, they, uh, they became a known Blood gang. So uh, the Bunny Boys, they weren't out in, in they, did they come out in the late 70s? Bunny Boys? That's the Emerald Hills thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, no. Bunny Boys wasn't in, the, in wasn't around in the, in the seventy. It, uh, Bunny Boys wasn't. They were like in the, in the eighties. Before that, Emerald Hills had a set called Hill City. Okay, Hill City. Now it takes somebody really from Emerald Hills to know they had HC, and it, and it stood for Hill City. And it was written on the side of a wall in Emerald Hills in the in the late 70s, uh, because see, my homeboy Woodlock, rest in peace, lived at right at the entry of Emerald Hills, uh, going into Emerald Hills. The entry Woodlock lived right there, and we went through Emerald Hills a lot uh, back then because Emerald Hills was like a neutral ground because it didn't have no sets, you know, but it was a black community without sets, you know? So uh, we, we went up to Emerald Hills a lot. In the late 70s, in like 1979, I start seeing Hill City uh, written on walls over in Emerald Hills. And I start seeing a little group, and it was a couple of dudes that used to hang out over on uh, Pyramid, that lived on Pyramid Street, and, and, and right on that wall that was, it was, uh, it was a little wall outside of somebody's house that said Hill City. And whoever lived there, I guess they was the one who had wrote Hill City because they used to be out there with their homeboys, like hanging out. But that didn't last uh, too long. I remember seeing the Hill City on the wall like for about a year or so, but they never really broke out of that shell. They never really came out and really put any force behind that name, you know, and eventually it died out, yeah. So before they became mm -hmm. Emerald Hills, it went from Hill City to Bunny Boys. Uh, I guess the Bunny Boys started uh, after that. Yeah, it went, it went from Hill City to, to, I guess, that Bunny Boy thing. I heard about them uh, being a Bunny Boy uh, thing. It was kind of like some play, Playboy thing. Like Encanto had to uh, consider himself Playboy. So Bunny Boys was like a Playboy uh, type thing, too, from what I understand. It was like more of a Playboy type Gang. And, and this community is where the the well known Sagan Penn grew up, right? Was he or was he, he was from Encanto? No, the incident that with him happened in Encanto. It did. But he mm -hmm. lived in. He lived in the hood. In well, Hills? well, his uh, I don't recall him uh, living in Emerald Hills. Uh, his grandfather lived over in the hood. Sagan Penn was uh, actually uh, he was he was really close with, with his grandfather. And when the incident happened with police, he drove to the hood in the police car because he had to. He, sh he, sh he shot the cop, and then he jumped in the in the cop's car and drove to his grandfather's house in the hood. So uh, we we all uh, knew him as being uh, from over in the hood. His family being over in the hood. Uh, I'm not disputing any ties to Emerald Hills, but I had never heard that he had any. Uh, 
ties to Emerald Hills. He could, so let me not say what I don't know, uh, but I don't ever, n never knew of him having any connection uh, to Emerald Hills. And so after the, the incident where he shot Officer Riggs, that happened mm -hmm. in Encanto, he yeah. drove to his grandfather's house uh -huh. in 40s hood. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He drove over there in the police car to, with the lights still on and everything, you know. Yeah, that's all he could think of. Let me get to my grandfather. That's who he was had the most influence on his life. He was the first thing he could think of. Let me get to my grandfather. Do you talk about the Sagan Penn incident in your book at all? Which is a well-known uh, situation here. Uh, no, I didn't uh, talk about it uh, in the book. I tried to but I could not fit it in in a way that would make the story flow without me going off track. It's a lot of things that I had to leave out of my book that were stories in themselves. So when you talk about the Sagan Pen issue, that's a whole story. You can't talk about that in a page, you know, and I'm not going to do a disservice to the memory of that brother and bring shit up. Uh, just one page, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a story that deserves to be told separately in its own right, you know, so I didn't combine it with anything that I did. Now, were you, were you out, were you out on the streets in 1984 when that happened? I sure was in 1985. Uh, I did get uh, locked up shortly after that, but I sure was out and I remember uh, the chaos that day. I remember seeing all the police cars headed over there, you know, and uh, it just was just uh, the, the news and the police was police was red lighting it with sirens all the way from downtown to Encanto. That's a <laughs> that's a hell of a long ways. They was coming from the actual police station that was in downtown San Diego with their sirens on hitting the freeway, you know, driving miles out to Encanto to get there, you know, the whole way, you know. And it must have been um, a very memorable incident in San Diego history. It was. Because it was, a, a, I guess a, you can say a well-known racist cop named Officer Riggs mm -hmm. was killed by Sagan Penn with his yeah. gun. Right. Um, yeah. Have you ever had any run-ins with Officer Riggs or knew about this officer? <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually did. Uh, right before before the Sagan Penn in incident, he pulled me over uh, one night, me and Huey. Me and a brother named Huey, he pulled us over on 60th in Encanto. And uh, just just for the hell of it, because that's how he got out at the time. You know, he had this fascination, you know, with, with, with black men, with young black men, you know, and he had this obsession with gangs and this fascination with, with, black, with, with young black men, you know. To him, all of us w was gang members, you know, and he just was really, you know, excited about that. You know, on the streets, we know who the cops are and who's who and, and how we label them. So on the streets, you know, it was like, we would say names of cops pulling up if they were known, you know, we'd be like, oh, here come Riggins. There go Riggins, y'all, you know, something like that. If, if police was known, uh, Kramer, he was another one that was known, and there go Kramer, you know. These were cops that was like very aggressive, you know, towards us, you know. So yeah, we definitely knew his name. You know. What about his partner, Donovan Jacobs? Uh, yeah, I only heard that name after the incident occurred. I'm pretty sure he was with him that night when I got pulled over because when he pulled me over uh, that night, it was just a, it was just uh, weeks before uh, that happened with him, and uh, he had a partner with him, and I'm pretty sure that's that's who it was. You know. Uh, when we we spoke before, you mentioned that these people used to carry white rags or white bandanas. Yeah, EPB. EPB. Okay, that was, um, that's, oh, so the Encanto Park Branksters, they were, mm -hmm. they were white bandanas. Yeah, okay. white and blue. They, white were, and they blue. would carry a white bandana 
but they carry the blue one. They kind of intertwine them with each other. They okay. carry two rags. Okay. All right. So, so by the time you get to the 1980s, the 40s, well established. West Coast, well established. Uh, the Five Nine Brims, well established. But now you have like a bunch of other hoods coming in. And I guess um, Lincoln Park is well known. Skyline becomes well known. Emerald Hills is well known. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talk about this in your book in terms of the mm -hmm. history of how the, all these hoods started to emerge. Yeah. Um, so what what do you kind of tell?